The Bible is clear that God loves us, and that's what this verse is all about. It says in John 3.16, This is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The Bible is clear. God loves us, right? That we are worthy of being saved. That God was willing to bring his son into this world. The, the amazing story of how Jesus came about, the word made flesh, all of that comes to fruition, comes to, to the point where, where Jesus, the Messiah, is here and God allows him to die as, uh, as the, the, the example, as the sacrifice. There's so many different ways, so, so, so many different symbols and metaphors that we could use to try to describe what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And, and, but all of that was for the purpose of allowing us to be able to have and to be granted eternal life. So if you think that you're not worth anything, you have to think again, right? Because God loves you and was willing to give Jesus up for us so that we could have eternal life, right? If we ever think that we have no worth, then that is the truth that we have to use to combat the lie from the devil in our minds. If we have no worth, then why would Jesus die for us, right? So let's take a few moments. We did this past Friday. We took, we took a few moments to look at the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. Today, we're going to take a look at the story of the resurrection of Jesus. The Gospels tell us that Jesus died on the cross in the afternoon that day. And then we are told that a rich man named Joseph asked for Jesus' body to be laid in a tomb that was actually his going to be his own tomb, but he wanted Jesus to be laid in that tomb. And so the Roman authorities allowed him to do that, but the Jewish authorities knew that Jesus had been talking about the fact that he might be coming back to life, his own resurrection, so they were able to place a guard at the tomb, and they even sealed the tomb with a large stone. I'm sure we've all seen the picture uh, of, of th that style of tomb with the large stone that they used to seal the entrance. And in fact, the gospel writers tell us that the some of Jesus's disciples, uh, women disciples in fact, uh, were preparing his body, they were preparing spices and perfumes to prepare his body for burial, but in fact that they went home that night in order to observe the Sabbath day, because of course they were faithful Jewish uh, people and they observed the Sabbath, they went home, they observed the Sabbath day, and, and you just have to imagine what that whole 24-hour period would have been like for them, knowing that their hopes had been dashed right? All of the disciples were hoping that Jesus was the one, was the Messiah, and their hopes were dashed because he was brutally beaten and crucified the previous day. And yet, as soon as the Sabbath was over, in the early morning hours of the first day of the week, some of the women disciples wanted to finish the preparation of his body, and so they went to the tomb where Jesus was laid, and this is what it says. Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. I'd be amazed too. <laughs> he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. So Jesus had risen from the dead. Soon after, Jesus appeared to his disciples, right? We, we, we've re read the story before, and if you don't know, Jesus appeared to his disciples. He showed them the marks of the nails in his wrists and in his feet. And he, and he showed them. He wasn't a spirit. He wasn't a ghost. He was a real, resurrected, immortal human being at this point. A genuine, permanent, immortality-given <laughs> resurrection had occurred, right? Like, th this is not supposed to happen, right? People don't come back from the dead. People don't come back from the dead and then can never die again, right? 
Because even in, in biblical times, even previous to Jesus, some people came back to life. We have stories of that in the Bible, but they, they died again, right? But Jesus came back to life and was given immortality, never to die again. That's not supposed to happen until the future, until the kingdom of God, right? But it, as, as a lot of theologians put it, the future has invaded the present with the resurrection of Jesus. And the cross of Jesus and his resurrection, in fact, we understand, is the launching point of the kingdom of God. And, and Jesus actually said that he must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now, he was lifted up on the cross, right? But he was also lifted up out of the grave in the resurrection. And so everyone who believes in the resurrected Messiah, the crucified and resurrected Messiah, are drawn to Jesus, are, 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 are able to, to have relationship with God through him, and are given eternal life. And that doesn't just mean that we have future eternity with God. It means we have an experience in our hearts and in our lives today. That eternal life is now within us, and we're no longer, how can I put it? I want to put it in a, in a very specific way. Like, death is no longer what characterizes us. And certainly our bodies and our world are marked with, uh, have the marks of death and sickness and all those things. But our spirit, so to speak, that, that part of us that we connect to God with, if that makes sense, um, that is alive, right? It's no, we're no longer dead in that way. So the cross followed by the resurrection of Jesus was God's way of declaring that the king had come, Right? Jesus, the Messiah, the King had come. He defeated evil, sin, and death. He had been raised to immortality. We're told that he's been given all authority and power. There is no king but Jesus. And all who look to him, all who believe in him, and all who live for him will be given eternal life to experience kingdom life now and in the future when the kingdom fully comes. So here's sort of the nutshell of, of uh, what I want to share here, that Look at this. The resurrection of Jesus means that we can have resurrection as well. Isn't that something that we should all be excited about? The resurrection of Jesus means that we too can have resurrection, right? That it's not just something that we look at and say it's, you know, it's either a historical fact or it's a story or it's a symbol, whatever, however you want to characterize the, the, uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? It's not just that. It's something that happens inside of us. That we too can also humble ourselves as Jesus did in death and also experience the resurrection, the newness of life. This is why Jesus said that we are to take up our cross and follow him. What does that mean? It means be like him in every way. Don't, don't think that we can, can do things on our own, but, but instead we, 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 we imitate Jesus in how he lived and died. And then we will be able to experience the blessing that he received as well. And that's what Paul was getting at when he said that the Messiah was raised as the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to him will be raised when he comes back. And so Jesus was already given resurrection by God, but all who trust in him and, 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 and live for him, all who belong to him, will also be raised when he comes back. And that means brand new bodies. No more death, no more pain, no more sickness, no more coronavirus, no more aging, no more decay. Perfect human existence. I can't, I muted you all, but I want to hear an amen. <laughs> the effects of evil, of sin, and death will no longer be a concern to us. And that will be a utopia. That will be truly radical. I, I think we're all looking for that in our lives. That we are consumed with the effects of evil, of sin, and of death. But we're looking for liberation. That's what we've been celebrating. The ultimate Passover, the ultimate exodus is the liberation from evil, sin, and death. And that's what Jesus has accomplished for us, and that's what Jesus brings to us. And, and so, yeah, we look forward to the future physical resurrection of the dead, 
But right now, we have something amazing. We've been given the very mind of the Messiah, of Jesus himself. The kingdom can come in our own lives now if we choose to embrace Jesus as our king. And we think, and we choose to embrace how he thought. So we think as he thought. And, and Paul says, I, I, I love the way he put it here. Paul said, I have been crucified with the Messiah. It is no longer I who live, but the Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in my life, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So what's he saying here? Uh, obviously, this is a metaphor, right? But again, like don't when I use words like metaphor or symbol, I, I really don't want us to think that I don't mean that those have those aren't real, those that they don't have any uh, any reality. They do, because what this is saying is is that you know so many people. I'll give you an example. So many people are lost in their addictions, whether it's to drugs, alcohol, sex food, whatever it might be. There's, there's so many different things that people are addicted to, right? That is living as if we are zombies, as if we're just automatons. We, we, we're, we're not alive. We don't have control over our own bodies, over our own selves. But if we say to God, if we say, and, and we mean it sincerely and we do it humbly, we say, God, I don't want to live like that any longer, right? I want to be crucified with the Messiah. That sounds strange to our ears. It's 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 a, it's, it's a little harsh, but boy, when you want to be when, when you want to confront the sin in your life, you got to be harsh, right? I want to be crucified with the Messiah, and I don't want to live as I did. I want the Messiah to live within and through me, so that when I do live my life, it it is the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me, who lives through me and I live for him. I hope that makes sense to us. I know it's metaphorical. I know it's it's symbolic. It's And it's hard to wrap our minds around sometimes. But the, the, the practical facts of it is we don't have to be bound to that which brings us death and, and, and destruction. We can be living for God and live in that newness of life. We don't have to identify with this age. We can be living as if we're already in the kingdom of God, right? And you know what? If we choose to be people who are living as people who are part of the kingdom of God and, and, and we have the king inside of us living through us, I want to give you three examples of what that might look like. And uh, I'll put them on the screen for you there. Firstly, I want us to consider that we can demonstrate self-control and bring order to the chaos of our lives. Because this current evil age, the, the world in which we live, is characterized by chaos. But God is the force of order, the force who brings order. And we're made in his image, and that means we have the gift that he has given us to choose to bring order to the chaos. And I have enough experience and I, I know enough about psychology to know that when you have a purpose, when, you bring or, when you're uh, endeavoring to bring order to your lives, that that brings you satisfaction. And, and, and when you take responsibility for your life and for something in your life that you want to organize, bring organization to, whether it's the outward chaos, and I could turn the camera right here and I can show you the chaos. Uh, this room's not so bad actually, but, but this room is not as organized as it could be, right? We call this actually our unroom because it's, it's the room in which we put lots of different things and it's not really organized. But the thing is, we can, we can choose to bring order to the chaos of our, of our lives, either outwardly or what about inside in our minds, right? Lots of us have chaos going on up here, whether it's the chaos of, of uh, negative thoughts saying that we're not good enough or that, uh, you know, you're a failure or you're ugly or whatever it is, right? Or what about the, the different quir quirks that many of us have, uh, personality quirks, whether it's uh, we're, we're, we're irritable or we, we are uh, angry too, too often or too much. There's lots of different emotional and psychological things that are chaotic in our lives, right? God wants to bring order 
to our minds and to our lives and to our world. And it is up to us to choose to be like Jesus and to choose to have him live through us, the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected Messiah, to live through us in order to see that come to, come to pass. Secondly, I want us to consider that what it means to believe in the resurrection of Jesus and how that works out in our lives means that we can manage anxiety and stress in our lives by trusting God that he will give us the wisdom we need to find the solutions to our, to our problems, right? God will give us the wisdom we need to find the solution to our problems. Everyone experiences stress and anxiety, and I think more so than ever before with this current situation that we find ourselves in, we have a lot of stress and anxiety going on. We don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, a lot of us are feeling kind of cooped up in our homes, and we don't know exactly uh, what, what, what we should be doing or, or how we can uh, get through this situation. And you know what, there, there is a bodily and chemical component to stress and anxiety, and I'm not a doctor, so please see your doctor about that. But as it relates to spiritually and psychologically, I want us to know that if we, again, if we submit ourselves to God, humble ourselves to God, and say, God, you are a God of order, a God who brings peace, right? That we can actually begin to see a lack of stress, a lack of, um, anxiety in our lives by by being people who are able to say we want to find wisdom and, and that's part of actually what I'm going to be talking about starting next week is the Bible is not necessarily a perfect rule book for our lives a perfect manual for our lives but it is certainly a a demonstration of God's people pursuing wisdom acquiring wisdom in order to live the life of God, the life, our lives for God. And so that's what I think we need to be doing as, as God's people living today, pursuing wisdom, pursuing truth and goodness and morality and virtue, all these different things, which makes us better people and gives us purpose. And you will see the stress and the anxiety begin to subside. And lastly, I believe that as a result of the resurrection of Jesus and as a result of you know embracing it in our own lives, that we can begin to be more optimistic, that we can begin to look at the bright side. We are not, as Paul said, people who have no hope, he said in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. We are not people who have no hope. We are people who do believe in, first of all, that we believe that we have been created, that we believe that God is there and he loves us, you know, and I, again, this is echo or this is a preview of next week. Maybe we don't understand what that means. Many of us don't understand what it means to believe in God or what it means to say that God is the creator and God is there. But we have this experience, this sense that God is there and he loves us and he, and, and he has a purpose for us. You know, uh, we'll get into this next week. You can see, you can tell that I'm eager to start preaching about th those things. But the point is this, is that we can always, whatever we're facing, and we're facing a challenging time right now, whatever we're facing, we can look at the bright side. We can have optimism and hope no matter what situation we find, our, we find ourselves in. This is so interesting because as I've been saying, I've been trying to be optimistic because I believe in it. I believe in the hope that we have. That no matter what goes on in this situation, yes, this is a challenge. We can't meet in person. We have a lot of technology we have to figure out. How are we going to make sure that, that, that we sustain our building and our finances? All of these different concerns that we have, right? But I think God is going to use this time to bring us closer together, to allow us to be there for one another on a personal level, more so than ever before, and to take this opportunity to say, you know, we're, we're going to start meeting more so than ever with Bible studies and, and other things through Zoom and, and through uh, live streaming. And we might come out of this situation more knowledgeable about Jesus, closer to him. We might grow as people through this situation. I, I think we will. There's so many different ways of looking at the bright side of this situation. And that's just the things off the top of my head. I'm sure we can all say, here, is the, here are the different things that we can look at to say, yes, this is a challenging time, but there's a bright side. 
there's actually good things that will come out of this situation. So that in, in, in one message is what I believe the significance of the resurrection of Jesus gives us. Hope for the future, hope that God is faithful to his promises, but not only that, we have an experience awaiting us if we humble ourselves to him. So we are the people who say, even so, no matter what happens, even so, come Lord Jesus. We mean that in our lives right now so that he can live in us and through us, but also one day so the whole world will see.